We are keeping our eyes on shares of Linamar today. They're trading lower, that following the release of their latest quarterly results in the after-hours market yesterday. Linamar says that we are happy with our first quarter results in a tough market environment. Let's hear more from the CEO of the auto parts company, Linda Hasenfratz, is joining us now. Linda, good to be able to catch up with you. Thank you for your time. No problem. Glad, glad to be here. I'd love to get your take um, just from a top-down perspective right now, macro picture. What, what are you seeing in the environment? Yeah, I mean, it's been a bit of a challenging environment in, uh, in many of our key industries. Global automotive production was off 5.1% in the first quarter, which is a lot. Uh, last year, global vehicle production was down and it's forecast to be down again this year. So, uh, I mean, not unusual for uh, the auto industry to go through uh, small dips and, uh, and then start to recover again. The expectation is for volumes to uh, start to rise again globally next year. So that's a plus. I mean, we're keeping a close eye on that. Uh, but yeah, there's some pressures in the market. I mean, the good news is we've got an enormous amount of work that's launching at Linamar right now. So we're offsetting that softness. I mean, global vehicle market's down 5%. Our sales were up 4% uh, in uh, overall uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, certainly being helped by our industrial division as well. Uh, but to me, that's the key, you know, content per vehicle growth, market share growth, that's how we get through uh, dips in the market. Right, and you've talked about that in the past with us in terms of trying to make it through um, some of these more difficult times or dips. Certainly there's trade tensions and there's a slower global growth outlook, it seems, um, but that your company evolves and, and you're seeing that in the industrial re results today. How, how are you doing this? What, what's some of the granularity behind it? Yeah, so, I mean, we've started diversifying our business actually probably 15 or 20 years ago with our acquisition of, uh, of Skyjack. Uh, we've continued to diversify uh, into agri the agricultural food market with uh, our acquisition of, of Macdon, a harvesting equipment company, a year ago, and look to continue to build both of those businesses. And uh, it's actually been fantastic because the cycles are a little different to the auto cycle, so it gives us opportunity to create consistent, sustainable growth. And I think that's really what we want. It's what our employees want in terms of sustainability for the future. It's what our shareholders want, and it gives us uh, a good, solid book of business. So uh, I think this more diver diversified approach has really been working well for us. And we found that uh, although each business is uh, independent and, and uh, reasonably standalone, the Macdon, Skyjack, and automotive businesses. They're all actually connected in many ways that is uh, allowing us to create enormous value through that interconnection, whether it be sharing ideas around lean manufacturing, other best of practice ideas, sharing people, uh, you know, bulk purchasing, all of these uh, levers are ways that we can get even more value out of these independent businesses. So mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like it's been a really successful strategy for us. Mm. I'm curious as to your thoughts in terms of what Toyota's announcement that they're going to have a new vehicle production uh, in Cambridge, how you think that might play out for the auto parts suppliers and, and how much of an impact will it have? Well, I think it's great news. I mean, anytime you hear about somebody investing uh, in uh, Ontario and in Canada, I think that's a great thing. It's certainly something we've been doing. We've invested uh, last year in Canada nearly $300 million in uh, new programs. So it's great to see somebody else stepping up as well. I think it's good for overall auto production and the industry in, uh, in our country and in our province. Uh, for sure, there's going to be suppliers that are going to benefit from that. So it's a good news story all around. Typically, for every one auto assembly job, there are six to seven other jobs created hmm. in the supply base and, and in organizations that support uh, those auto jobs. So auto jobs are really important to overall economic growth. Yeah, it's so significant if it's one to six. Uh, Linda, do you think that we'll see more announcements like this? Were you surprised about the Toyota announcement? I mean, I hadn't heard about it uh, ahead of time, but I'm not surprised because I think that uh, we've got a great uh, environment here that is uh, is uh, competitive. I mean, obviously, there's areas I'd like to see mm -hmm. uh, get more competitive, but uh, we, too, have grown our business enormously 
here in Canada over the last decade. I mean, uh, you know, we've increased our, our employee base uh, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent just in the last seven years. So we're growing here as well. And, and we're growing here because it's a great place uh, for us to, uh, to manufacture. It's a great place for manufacturing. It's close to our customers. We have a deep level of expertise here. We have our most productive plants in the world uh, here in Ontario. Out of our 60 plants globally, our 22 Canadian plants are our most productive uh, globally on, on, the, on the auto side for sure and in our other businesses uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, to us, it's, it makes a heck of a lot of sense to continue to grow our business here. And obviously, Toyota felt the same way. Linda, we just heard that uh, Saskatchewan's Premier Scott Moe, he responded that Saskatchewan's court ruling deeming the carbon tax being constitutional from a federal perspective. When you talk about, you know, maybe some improvements in terms of making the economy and the manufacturing sector even stronger, what's your view on carbon tax? Yeah, I think that uh, if we want to make uh, change uh, in the environment, we should be working together as a team. Uh, we accomplish things when we work together, not when we're fighting with each other. And I, I really think that both federally and provincially, uh, we need to come together and come up with a solution that will allow us to have access to clean, cost-effective energy when we need it. Uh, and I think that those, all of that is not mutually exclusive. I think there's a way to find those solutions, uh, but only if we all work together. So, you know, we can't have the federal uh, side doing one thing, provincial doing something else and uh, in conflict. So, you know, I think we need to have a national energy strategy. I think it needs to be uh, federal and provincial in all of our provinces and that we come together to figure out a solution. And we have the solutions here in Canada. We could have a real advantage on a global stage if we were to work together instead of working at odds with each mm -hmm. other. Well, and especially since there is still uncertainty surrounding the USMCA, the new NAFTA. Um, you've talked to us in the past about how you are planning for uh, NAFTA or USMCA. Uh, the fact that it isn't technically done yet. Um, what does that mean to you in terms of strategizing? Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, it, it doesn't affect our strategy. We tend to think very long term. Uh, and I see all of this, uh, these trade issues and tariff uh, issues uh, as being very short term. It's a noise uh, that uh, is going on right now that is, you know, creating issues. Uh, but it's not uh, a reason to change your strategy. Uh, so strategically, it's not, not uh, changing things. For me, uh, the, the ratification of USMCA, I mean, I think we should be moving forward with it. Obviously, we came to mm -hmm. an agreement on this trade agreement, you know, six, eight months ago. It's crazy that we haven't uh, ratified it as yet. But happily, in the meantime, we have NAFTA. So in the absence of USMCA, we have NAFTA. We're continuing to operate in, uh, in, as uh, mm -hmm. a continent in a reasonably cost-effective manner. Uh, what I think is more important is that the tariffs get removed. It, to me, it's completely illogical that we have tariffs between three countries that have agreed to a trade agreement. Uh, and uh, it, what worries me is that the companies that are most effective and being most negatively affected are American companies. American companies who are paying more for product that they're buying from overseas and getting less business to export because of the retaliatory tariffs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's costing our customers billions of dollars. And, you know, this is a critical time in the automotive industry in, in particular where there's so much change going on. And the last thing that our customers uh, need to be doing is spending half their profit funding the U.S. Treasury when they should be spending all their profit investing mm -hmm. in new types of propulsion and autonomy and mobility mm -hmm. and a transitioning industry. And the longer these tariffs are in place, the, the, the less uh, able our customers are to do that. And the rest of the world is moving ahead. Mm. And I think that you know, we really need to be concerned about this. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's having economic impact. Uh, it is part of what's going on in terms of the automotive cycle. And you know the the volumes, uh, uh, you know, feeling some pressure, uh, and it, it's it's destructive. Yeah. You know, it it is not helpful to uh, have half your profits.
funding the U.S. Treasury. Uh, you need those to invest in the future. And, and the sooner that the, the politicians recognize that uh, and drop the tariffs, I think the better for the health, the short-term health mm -hmm. and the long-term health yeah. of the overall industry. And, and we are seeing that actually really play out in some of the U.S. economic data as of late. It is definitely slowing, and you are hearing it from the company management's on their quarterly conference calls. Um, Linda, actually, I should ask you as well, uh, speaking of that, what, what's your main message to shareholders today? The stock's down a little bit on the back of the quarter. A lot of the analysts are saying it was pretty much an inline quarter. Um, what's your main message in terms of the outlook for the company and how you're managing things? Yeah, I mean, we are very optimistic. As I mentioned at the outset, we have a huge amount of new business that's launching. We've increased market share in you know, almost every area of our business globally. Uh, content per vehicle up uh, on, in our auto business. Uh, MacDon's increasing market share on draper headers, on the harvesting equipment. Skyjack's increasing market share, even in core products like Sigilis, where we've long, uh, long been a, a leader in the market. And that's what's important, right? That, that uh, market share growth, when markets do you know, stabilize and start to uh, grow again, is going to mean uh, above market growth. And you know, if I look back at the last 20 years, you know, the first 10 years of this decade, we saw, just on the auto side, automotive uh, volumes decline at a rate of 3.3% compounded annually from 2000 to 2008. In that same time period, Linamar grew earnings by almost 11% compound. Hmm. If I look from 2009 to 2018, now we're seeing growth uh, on the uh, automotive side uh, in the single digits uh, of somewhere between 5 and, and uh, 7%. Uh, Linamar earnings per share grew 97%. 97% mm, right. <laughs> in the last, uh, in the last uh, nine years. So over that whole first you know, 18 years of, of this uh, century, we've grown at a compound annual rate of 16%. Mm. We grow through tough times. We grow through strong times. We're a company that continues to grow uh, and find ways to, uh, to, to uh, see success uh, regardless of what's going on with the cycle. So don't get preoccupied by the auto cycle. We'll get through this just like we have everyone in the past mm -hmm. uh, and continue to drive that consistent, sustainable earnings growth. Linda, great to catch up with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much. You too. All the best. Thanks, you too. That's Linda Hasenfranch. She's the Chief Executive Officer at Linamar.